being your MC today. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies, ISAS, and NUS, I welcome you to this afternoon's panel discussion titled The Evolving Centers of Women in Pakistan. Following the panel discussion by a group of eminent speakers from Singapore and Pakistan on several important aspects of the evolving status of women in Pakistan, we will have the official launch of an art exhibition featuring a selection of paintings of five contemporary female artists from Pakistan. Now we will commence with the panel discussion. I would like to introduce the following distinguished panelists who are on stage. First, Ms. Emma J. Flett, Visiting Research Fellow of ISAF and US. Ms. Selena Islam, Artist and Educator. Associate Professor Iqbal Singh, Visiting Research Associate Professor of ISAF and US. Mr. Imran Nasrullah, CEO and President Director of Cargill Pakistan and Director of Cargill Asia Pacific Singapore. Sharing the session is Dr. Iqbal and Chaudhary. Principal Research Fellow of ISAS NUS and former Foreign Minister of Bangladesh. I will now hand the floor to Dr. Chaudhary. Dr. Chaudhary, please. Thank you, Rajni. Uh, Director Raja Mohan, uh, members of the diplomatic form, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I bid you a very warm welcome this ISAS panel discussion on the evolving status of women in Pakistan. Uh, we consider all of you, by the way, as uh, uh, friends of ISAS because you are the champions of our efforts in Singapore uh, to, to, uh, towards enhancing the understanding of South Asia in this region and beyond. Our mandate uh, speaks of uh, politics and economics, but at the root has got to be investigations into society and the peoples. Therefore, we also try our hand at innovative ways to make the intellectual connect. Uh, this leads us oftentimes, or sometimes at any rate, to creative expressions of societal views through mediums such as uh, literature, literature or, or final arts. Our uh, offer to you this afternoon is on, 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 of that genre. This is going to be an event with a difference. Uh, uh, this is because it will compose of both oral and visual components. You will uh, first hear and listen to, uh, to uh, a set of distinguished, very distinguished panelists on this important subject. And thereafter, uh, you will uh, uh, view a rendition of, uh, through the medium of uh, paintings of five Pakistani women artists on the subjects of our, on the subject of our talk. The idea, the idea is to stimulate both your mind and senses almost simultaneously, and uh, uh, so that you you are introduced. Uh, to the subject of our discussion in a comprehensive fashion. And the topic at hand today is an important one, of course. Uh, this is, uh, uh, it is because all of you are aware that Pakistan today is in the cusp of changes. As history unfolds, sometimes there are certain happenings that spark interest, become watersheds of change and benchmarks to uh, mark uh, human progress. For some time, there are some apprehensions, with or without reason, that the Pakistani society was straining at the seams with a myriad of issues. Then certain good things began to happen. The civil society became active, violence became contained, and elections were held that rekindled the hope for a stable and prosperous civic existence for the young and old, for men and women. And it is to the women of Pakistan that this event is devoted. It begins with what I hope would be a thought-provoking series of presentations uh, 
horrifying as I have said the, the, the visual uh, uh, exhibition of visual arts. Uh, Pakistan's founder, Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Ali Azam, had said that no nation can stand, uh, can rise to the heights of glory without women standing side by side with men. Today, we shall discuss if that were a simple uh, statement of aspiration or did the passage of time and experience, did uh, that passage bring this to fruition? To examine this and other such questions, we have a galaxy of informed experts and they will take us to the gamut of uh, women's role in Pakistan across the broadest societal spectrum, which would be the arts, uh, politics, and business. Well, my files are already given you. Uh, you. You have those details, and I shan't take up uh, time introducing them individually. And I shall now call upon the panelists 15 minutes uh, for each. Uh, and I shall start with, begin with uh, our colleague at ISAS, Dr. Emma Jane Flatt. Of women over 25 have some secondary education as compared to 
quote, as long as both parties carried visible signs of being male and female. The 2017 census actually gave the right to transgenders to identify themselves as transgender and therefore be counted. 10,418 chose to do so. Now that's interesting, that figure, because uh, estimates of the um, estimates by activists and so on of the size of the population range from 300,000 to 500,000. So the fact that only a little more than 10,500 chose to publicly identify themselves as transgender, <coughs> even though they have a legal right to do so, is also significant. Why is it significant? Well, because despite the fact that they are legally recognized, and despite the fact that they have been a part of South Asian culture for the very longest of times, mentions of transgender people right back to the ethics, and probably even earlier. There are the transgender community in Pakistan, as a likely transgender community in India, is a, a subject to brutal attacks, rape, and murder. Just between 2014 and 2016 alone, 45 transgender uh, people were killed in Kaiba province. So you can, you can pretty much understand why they would choose not to identify themselves necessarily in uh, states and sexes. I can give an example of some of the ways in which uh, uh, transgender people come under pressure. This um, trans lady here, Alicia, she was shot um, seven times um, for rejecting male advances. Her friends rushed her to the hospital. And then as she was bleeding to death outside, the hospital staff mocked her and said, are you a man or a woman? Where should we take you? Which ward should we take you? So she died. So here's my third caveat. Given the diversity, size, and complexity of this country, I can't possibly hope to give a complete picture. So I'm just going to make a few general comments on some of the issues facing Pakistan today without in any way suggesting so I've just got a couple of slides that talk about how uh, Pakistan is seen by uh, contemporary development indexes. Uh, one that was compiled by the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, suggests that Pakistan, in terms of gender inequality index, is ranked 130 out of 188 countries. And I've given you some other numbers there for comparison. You see Sri Lanka 87, Bhutan 110, Nepal 115, Bangladesh 119, India 125, and Afghanistan. In a recent poll conducted by the Thomson Reuters Foundation of the most, world's most dangerous countries for women, um, which surveyed aid and development professionals, academics, health workers, policymakers, NGO workers, journalists, and social commentators, um, Pakistan was ranked six. Say that's sixth worst. So it's the sixth worst country in the world. Controversially, India was ranked first, and the US was ranked tenth. Um, now, of course, with, as with any of these kind of compilations of indexes and polls, you can take issue with the methodology, and certainly there are things that can be said about that. It's not my field, so I'm not going to dwell any longer there. One thing is clear, though, um, is that there are significant issues wherever you rank Pakistan, facing women in Pakistan. World Bank data shows that almost one in three married Pakistani women report facing physical violence from their husbands, although informal estimates. A recent report uh, by a non-profit women's organization said that every day of the year, six women were murdered, six were kidnapped, four were raped, and three were suicide. Dowry violence and acid attacks are in addition to that. Women in Pakistan also face more mundane challenges. According to a recent report, Pakistan has one of the highest rates of child stunting in the world, with 48% suffering from some level of mal malnutrition. And politicians have turned to promoting breastfeeding as a silver bullet, um, exhorting women with Quranic verses. I don't know if you can see this, it's a bit small, but there's Quranic verses there. And mother's milk is said to be an obligation to her child and a covenant with her love. Um, but one of the things that they haven't done, so they put, they've, in, they've made a big fuss, and Shabazz Shalisa in Punjab made a big fuss about focusing on banning formula. But of course, one of the problems with banning formula milk is you stigmatize all of those people who actually have problems with breastfeeding. There is no concern, no equivalent concern given to maternal health, things like a mother's nutrition, maternity care, or access to birth control. There is no 
similar focus given to the implementation of existing legal provisions, for example, maternity. There is no concern, no kind of public campaign to try and make a change in wealth culture or workspaces, for example, giving robes and allowing times for us Now, Pakistan is in no way unique here. Um, in the US, Pakistan at least has mandated paid maternity leave. In the US, you don't even get paid maternity leave. Okay, so we shouldn't feel too hard or hard, harshly about Pakistan, but one of the things I want to just kind of draw your attention to is the way in which Pakistani women face problems that women all over the world face. And that sometimes when we look at the bigger picture, the more, the more dramatic effects, we also lose sight of the fact that these are also issues of Pakistan. Get a 
sense of how dramatic this was and how much it shocked them. One of the really interesting things too, though, was the way in which Pakistani society struggled to know how to deal with her. Was she an embarrassment? Was she a feminist hero? Was she somebody they should embrace? Or was she somebody who was being manipulated by the system? Um, and so there was some infighting amongst feminists, some of whom said she clearly was a troubled woman, and others said, no, she's a woman who's living her own life, and she herself, I mean, these are all um, Images have been created afterwards. You can see this famous image of her that was painted by, I'm not quite sure exactly who it was, who did it, but it's found on the website Chain, which is a crowdsourced website in Pakistan. And then you get the Kandil Guruj masks, which appear in almost every local women's protest since. Um, they're almost everywhere. And you get pictures of Kandil Guruj with all these kind of inspirational photos. So that's kind of dark side of social media. <coughs> But there are more um, uplifting stories. There are a whole series of women, and I'm probably running out of time, so I'm going to whiz through them, but who have used this particular medium as a way to fight back. So my girl, who was attacked uh, with acid, decided she would um, almost live blog her recovery and her, uh, her prosecution of her attacker. Her attacker was, as is often the case, a very close family member. So many members of her family turned against her and refused to support her. Her, her um, solution to this silencing was to use social media. So she called herself Acid Survivor and she made a Facebook account on Instagram. Kali Jessaliki, some of you may have heard of this, she was attacked by her ex boyfriend in the street, stabbed 23 times, and then brought a case against him once she recovered from death's door. What did she find? But that none of the lawyers would take. Why? Because her attacker was the son of a famous lawyer. So what did she do? She took refuge in online web rooms and web spaces, chatting with human rights activists. One of them, who was a trainee lawyer, took up her case and launched a huge media campaign focusing on showing explicit images of her wounds and her fight. And naming and shaming the guy on the right is the boy who attacked her. This is the guy who, he was eventually sentenced to seven years, and then the High Court overturned the judgment and let him go free. Because, again, it's crazy. Um, she is, I think, it, it, so that created such an outcry, again, because of the social media campaign, that the Supreme Court then took up the case on a sword of talking about change. There are other ways, and more mundane ways, in which Pakistani women are using social media to reclaim their space in Pakistani society. Um, and this one, I just stumbled across, it's called Girls of Colors. And these, this is a group of women who started taking pictures of themselves loitering, chilling, hanging out, just having a cup of tea in public. Because their rationale was, girls are often told it's not, it's not proper behavior, it's not the way to behave. And we need to show that it is, and it's entirely okay. And so people started uploading pictures of themselves. And I particularly like this one, because they've got these girls that are written underneath, does it count as girls at Dabas? If the proprietor makes you sit so far away from the males at Daba that you are just girls on cycle? <laughs> they moved on from this kind of initial just sort of compilation of photos to actually starting a public campaign for the importance of loitering. And they make a very important point, which is that we all think about human rights and the right to freedom of expression and freedom, freedom even fear for freedom from the fear of violence. But this one on the right actually makes a, the point that this is a right which we state to claim as women. It is a time we claim not just it is time to, it is time we claim not just the right to work, but also the right to play. The idea that women shouldn't have to be scared in public spaces, that they have a right to inhabit them as much as women. This turned into uh, a, a, they're on their third annual rally now, uh, girls on bikes. Um, various different signs that you see there, to tire of the patriarchy, and the and so on. The other thing I thought was really interesting though about social media 
of girls at Dubbers, and they uh, they took up this idea, but specifically when the Indian film Padman was banned in Pakistan. And you can say here, you see here, here this woman writing, "Hey, that's joy, Muslim women, Muslim women menstruate, non-men Muslim women menstruate." There's nothing against our Islamic traditions. Banning the film means you're telling women your monthly flow is shameful and must be covered in misogyny and brown bags. So once again, it's trying to find the space to just be a woman. One last thing I just want to mention, I can come back to it if we have time, is the way in which this, uh, this the, the, the kind of the feminism that you see in the activism that you see in more activist circles has now become mainstream. And there are a series of two uh, commercials made by the Spice brand, Shan. Uh, the first one, uh, it's all about a Chinese expat living in Pakistan and how she feels completely lonely and she can't bond. And her husband says, come on, you've got to make a bit of an effort. And she says, it's not easy, we don't even eat the same food. And she's sitting there so sadly. And then she has an idea, she's going to learn how to cook biryani. So she goes to the supermarket, she buys her shan mix, she cooks some amazing biryani, she takes it to the neighbours and they welcome her in. And it receives a lot of pushback because it was basically saying women can only bond when they're A, wearing stuff, and B, cooking food. So, what I found really interesting is that Sean came up with a new one, because they got all this pushback. In which, one million and one family. A Damar, a son-in-law, comes to visit his prospective family. He's a bit metrosexual, he's a bit urban, he's not at all rural and rough and macho, they're all comedy players and wrestlers and whatever, and they're very shocked at him, and they basically bully him. And they make fun of him, they think they, they try and provoke him to cry. And then their cook runs away. And they don't know what to do. So he says, Oh, don't worry, I'll do it. He rushes into the kitchen, whips up a huge biryani, brings it to the table, and they cry tears of joy. And so, you know, the whole idea of reversing who gender roles has now become mainstream. And Sean is making them. <laughs>
uh, about political or social issues through the artwork. So it was very restricted at that time. So that is the reason that I actually wanted to start with that period so we can see the difference in art that we are having now in Pakistan. So uh, the female artists at that time, uh, they began to serve a commentary of the, the philosophy of the 1980s against the female self-expression. So there were many levels of struggle they had to deal with. And, uh, they created many artworks that served as reaction to Jamosia's policies and the gender marginalization. But most of these artworks, they could not be very direct because uh, you were not allowed to show any social political imagery. And uh, that was because uh, they were afraid of the, the security and the, that was also because of the safety reasons. So they had to use an other way showing what they felt. So they uh, came up with different ways and what they did, they used um, metaphors and symbols in their work. And that is also like, I do that a lot with my work also. So actually your artwork is not like very direct in that way. So you're not like very direct in what you want to say as a message. But if you use symbols and metaphors, you can still get the message across, but like, I would say it's like in a, in a long way. Um, so this was the period where there was a lot of restriction, but after that there was a transition to the contemporary uh, art, and that was in the 1990s and 2000, and uh, a very big part of that was Salima Hashmi. She, was in the, she is an eminent social political artist, and she took over as the principal of the National College of Art. So she had a big influence and she encouraged more conceptual forms of art. So actually the art form started changing over there. So this was the history I wanted to talk about and um, the art critic, Amba Ali, that I spoke to, like I wanted to see her perspective because she writes about art and female artists she has seen the era of uh, uh, what was before now and um, the thing that she says is like um, that the early works of the female artists were important because I think if you are living in a state of suppression you actually are going to rebel and female artists were doing that through their work but the time that you are living in now in Karachi and I don't think there's a lot of suspicion for like, you know, for female artists or for artists in any way. Uh, we do have to be careful with, yeah, still with political views. So we try to avoid that still a little bit. But I want to come back to Dr. Emma, the transgender, uh, what you were talking about. There are artists who have actually uh, painted about transgenders through their art. And uh, I think there's still a lot of freedom in that way. So like uh, there is a lot of movement, there's a lot of growth, but you need to understand that yeah, Pakistan is still a very Islamic country. So there are still a lot of restrictions, but I think we are moving to a better future where we are actually like exploring more directions as an artist. Uh, the other thing is um, there are most of the gallery owners and, and directors in uh, Pakistan are female. So actually the females are setting the trend of art, the direction of art in Pakistan. And I think that is wonderful. Because uh, I know most of the galleries in Lomo, Karachi, Islamabad, that is actually where the galleries are. Most of them are in Karachi. But most of the art gallery owners are all female. I think that there's only one or two that I know of that are male. So I think they are doing a wonderful job. So they are actually setting the, the art movement in Pakistan. Uh, another thing is that I also believe that the line between gender, female and male in art is getting thinner. Like it's actually disappearing. It's not that I'm a female artist, he's a male artist. 
And uh, the thing is, yeah, there are still more male artists in the industry, but I think it's not only in Pakistan, I think that's all over the world. And there are more male artists than female, and that was also that in history. If you look in the history of Renaissance, you'll see more male artists in the, in the history books than you'll see female artists. And one of the reasons that I believe, so now I'm coming like what I believe as an artist is, uh, you do like as a female, you have a family, you have children. So I do believe that takes time away from your art. If you are single, you want to be a single artist. And there are actually female artists who have chosen to be single, so they can just focus on their art. Um, also, a part of my series that I've worked on for this uh, exhibition has to do with that. Like, as a female, you give more time to your family. Uh, the time for your art is taken away from you. But that is, again, you need to balance it as a female artist. So I think that is a big difference between female and male. Another difference that I want to show between like the European and uh, I think mostly Asia, like Pakistan, is that um, our galleries in Pakistan are, are mostly commercial galleries. They are not funded, they don't get any funding from the government. So they uh, rely on the sale of the art. So if you are going to be commercial and you rely on the art sale, uh, you are going to be selecting artists also, like personal, like who have work that is going to be uh, bought by people. So um, I went to Canada in June for an artist residency, and the wonderful thing that you, if you're spending a month in another country, I uh, met a lot of artists over there, female artists. I went for an organization that actually supports female artists in Canada. And uh, I went to the studios, I spoke to a lot of them. So the thing there is you can apply for grants, you can get funding as an artist, as a gallery also. So that supports you as an artist, in the, I think in a very great way, because you'll be more free to produce work that you maybe want to produce. And you maybe will not be producing if like, uh, you have to work for a gallery. But the future of Pakistan and art in Pakistan, I think it's uh, really coming up. There are more artists going uh, international now also. Uh, an example that Dr. Emma was talking about, like um, the female victims, like the women victims. So we have Shani Obey, the filmmaker, who got like uh, several uh, Oscar awards for her movies. So she's also an artist, but she makes movies. She makes like the uh, but she does address the things happening in Pakistan that she thinks that we should look at and maybe we can improve it in some way. Um, so, uh, yeah, the direction that uh, the female artists that I discussed with my uh, art critic is that she did think that the voices previous were stronger of the female artists and now that art is going more it's becoming more like an entrepreneurship that artists are going uh, towards the markets instead of uh, speaking from inside. But I think that has to do with the time that you live in. Like if you're going to be in a war zone, your work I think automatically is going to be stronger than somebody who's living like peacefully and actually doesn't have much to say. So I think that is a big difference. Um, Female artists are also working with more mediums, and I am working with textile and photography. So previously mostly it used to be painting, but uh, sculpture is coming up now, and uh, artists are also working with metal, video making, film making. So we are exploring more fields than we used to explore. Uh, we had our first uh, Karachi Biennale in 2017. I think that was a big step for Pakistan to have the first Biennale and I think it was a huge success. A lot of, like, I think 265 artists in total participated, like Pakistani artists and international artists. Uh, that same year, Lahore had also a Biennale. So they had the same thing they did with their artists, also Pakistan.
Pakistani international writers. It's going to be repeated again next year, so we are already preparing for that. Uh, a lot of performance artists coming in also, like that is something new, that's a new direction that we are exploring. But uh, I do think, like, art, what it used to be, I think we are getting a lot of freedom to express ourselves much more. And with the new, uh, with our new Prime Minister, like, we hope we see a better future and that it will evolve in a better way. And I think that is it.
safe to say we are very surprised when they name the countries that actually like recognize it, the legal rights of the gender. You know, Pakistan is already named, Nepal, India, Bangladesh, Germany, Australia, and New Zealand. And the reason I do this is that I, I want to push that. And I want to do this here as well. Uh, when we talk about issues related to women um, in South Asia specifically, in Pakistan specifically, so in this discussion itself, we also need to move beyond a binary of um, progressive traditionalism and progressive modernism. That quality, as, as already has been alluded to, gender issues are particularly problematic in modern theorizations of gender. So I, I just want to throw this up. Kind of thing. I want to just put, throw up two more broad points and then go into my talk in particular. And this is um, women, of course, not homogeneous. So we talk about their participation in politics. We need to note their the divergences, the disparities within women itself, the rural urban divide, economic class divides, etc. Um, different social and religious political views as well. But the other broad thing I want to throw up is that when we talk about women in politics, we need to know that it's not just about women participating in politics. The woman is a subject of political debates, but she's often also the site of political debates. And here I mean often a lot of national imaginations. What nation should be, the future of the nation, the idea of what this proper citizen should be, often gets mapped onto the woman's body itself. What she can do, the spaces she can inhabit, but also who's the govern her, her being itself. So I want to throw this up as I so go ahead. And um, since there's a lot of, um, um, I should say, a lot of uh, women activists in um, Pakistan often refer to Muhammad Ali Jinnah to substantiate their views, to legitimize their views. I thought it might be a good point to actually start with uh, Jinnah's own ideas as well and some early history. Um, also, given that um, today we hear in Pakistan that in India, Pakistan is going to rise, which is going to go back to Jinnah's visions. So let's, let's have a kind of vision here. Now, um, I think I should quote you a speech, an excerpt from a speech that Jinnah made in 1944 in Aligarh. And this is of course before partition itself. But this is one of the speeches that women activists have to go back to. It is a crime against humanity that our women are shut up within four walls of the houses as prisoners. There is no sanction anywhere for the deplorable conditions in which our women have to live. You should take your women along as your comrades in every sphere of life. This one is which is that I could quote you more, but I don't think this makes the point. And in line with this, the Muslim League had actually established um, a number of organizations um, to get women to actively mobilize support for the demands of Pakistan. Um, some of these were the All India Muslim Subcommittee of the Muslim League, Muslim Girls Student Federation, set up in 1941, the Women's National Guard, etc. Et Maybe I should just point out that, and I should say I'm guilty of this as well, as a historian of modern South Asia, many of us who look at the debates about the partition have actually not looked at the gender about women's participation. Women are often studied in the context of being victims of partition, but their participation in the Muslim League, for instance, or the opposition to the Muslim League, this uh, work needs to be done on this as well. Um, there were a number of uh, figures here. These are women who are part of the Muslim League who are leading a Jalsa in Lahore. Um, these are actually women who joined the National Guard, etc. And one of the leading pioneers of um, Muslim League politics actually is somebody maybe some of you may be familiar with Begum uh, Rana Yaqab Ali Khan, who was very involved in uh, the Muslim League prior to partition, but also very involved with the Muslim League post partition as well. And uh, I won't go into too much detail about her life, except for that she actually became the first woman to be elected into parliament under a general election system. So I will not reserve seats as well. I'll come back to that point in a bit. Now, some other figures that um, one may be familiar with, um, of course, Fatima Jannah, uh, again, who was this then. And um, in 1956, she stood for elections um, as a presidential candidate against the military dictator Ayub Khan. This is actually an image of her with Ayub Khan. And I'm presuming we know who she is, right? She's from Ali Jannah's sister. Um, and that's her addressing a rally in the 1956 election as well. 
This election was interesting in, in many ways. Um, there was no real chance of actually winning the election because the political structure was structured in a way that was going to win. We'll go into that in the uh, in question and answer. But what was particularly interesting is he emerged as the candidate of the um, what was called the combined opposition parties. And these part, this combination of parties included the Islamists as well. Islamic parties and Islamists, I can differentiate between the two. And the Jamaat Islami, for instance, which actually believes that women are not able, women should not be allowed to be head of state, actually compromised in their position to support Fatima Jinnah's candidacy. So interesting complexities laying out. Okay. Now, if we move ahead into um, independent Pakistan and the position of women in parliament itself, what we find is that the first constituent national assembly um, after independence had two women, um, so it's about 2.5% of, of, uh, of participatory level. The constitution of 1956 granted uh, 10 reserve seats in the national assembly of the Liberal house, which gave up to about 3%. But what was fundamental was the constitution in 1973, um, which specifically stated that there should be no discrimination on the basis of gender. So, gender is actually uh, mentioned there. What is the uh, What's also interesting is in 1973 you have the institutionalization, constitutional institutionalization of the seats reserved for women in parliament. So, but you also have Article 228, which stated that the Council of Islamic Ideology, this body that is supposed to be formed, which was formed, to um, ensure that laws that will be formulated in the legislature were in line with Islam, the constitution stated that there must be one female member at least in this council. So, so, so it's interesting, uh, even in the space of religion as well, uh, the allegation, constitutional allegations as well. In 1977, I'm just going up some landmark moments, 1977, you had the first women elected to parliament under the general seat, so not from the reserve seat, and I mentioned who she was earlier, but she could not assume this uh, position because of military coup by Zia we heard about earlier. Now this is a this is a um, this is a graph that displays the, the uh, number of seats that have been reserved for women over the years. And I'd just like to point out that in 1999 to 2000 uh, there were no no reserve seats for women. And the reason for that is the 1973 constitution had a, a uh, sunset clause, which meant that three election cycles later this would be done away with because society would have advanced to the level at which women would be able to be elected from general parliamentary seats. Um, unfortunately, that has not happened. So it was found in the 2000s that you needed to have reserve seats again so they come back in, in the subsequent constitution. I think we have to bear that in mind itself. And you can map this onto. Um, sorry, I've uh, oh, sorry. So I was going to put another graph, which I unfortunately didn't have. But essentially, what you can find is if you actually look at the number of women who get elected to parliament, they generally map onto this number of reserve seats. Very rarely do you get uh, more women's parliament in any substantial number. So reservations, reserve seats for women is fundamental to having women participation uh, in, in the system itself. Now, since 2001, you have 17% of seats being reserved for women in all elected local bodies. So this means lower house, the upper house, but also at lower local levels of governance itself. And I just want to point out that if you look at the National Assembly or what we generally call the lower house, there is an interesting system that plays out. This is the proportional representation system. So how this works, and this is implications which I want to discuss in a second. How this works is a number of seats are reserved, and in this case 60 seats are reserved for women in the lower house. Um, and these are allocated to parties who have won seats already. So the large, there's a formula that's worked out, one seat for every 2.5 or 3.5 seats that the party has won, goes to them, and therefore, they divide divided up among the parties. And this has interesting outcomes which are worth bearing in mind. Because even the Islamist parties who do not want women to participate, want to have women in parliament to represent them. Because they want to benefit from the proportional representation system. And so so it, the, the interesting thing is that dynamics that the play out. I'll come back to this point in a second, but I want to point out that in 2017 and 2018 there were some very important developments 
And he, these were actually spearheaded by the Election Commission of Pakistan. In 2017, the Election Commission stated that at least 10% of each constituency had to, sorry, at least 10% of voters in a constituency had to be women for the election to be valid. Now the context of this is there are a number of constituencies where women have never voted. And so this was an interesting mechanism in which there was an attempt to ensure that women are not barred from voting. And just in case we live under a misconception that women only rural women don't vote, studies have shown that actually in a number of urban centers, um, especially Karachi, Lahore, and Faisalabad, there are actually constituencies in which no women is voting. So, so it's not just a rural thing, so I just want to highlight that and discuss this in a second. So, now this was this 10% was implemented by Section 9 of the Elections Act. But the Election Commission, and I, in my other work, I've actually criticized the Election Commission of Pakistan for bungling the election process a fair bit. But credit where credit is due, there was a concerted effort to actually register women voters in large parts. In fact, one of the things they did was they actually uh, organized what are known as the MRV, so the Mobile Registration of Voters system, in which there were all sorts of vehicles that the Election Commission of Pakistan and NGOs used to mobilize. So, the figure that comes up is that over 45 million women were registered to vote in this election. I'm still waiting for the official figures of how many actually voted, but this is the number that, that we have uh, registered. But there's another act um, in the election um, act. There's another clause in the election act which is also important here. This is section 206, which stipulates that any party that wants to stand for elections must, must allocate 5% of general seats to women. So 5% of seats must be allocated for a party to legitimately stand in the election itself. So all parties are forced to now field women. Now, as I look at the context, there are areas in which women have been unofficially banned from voting, etc. I won't go into that too much because what I want to do now is just access this, this point as well. So let's now in this 5% uh, mandatory or the mandatory issue of women parties having to field 5% of seats, allocate 5% of seats. Now, on paper, this sounds incredibly uh, something to be incredibly optimistic about. I have a slightly different opinion about this. The reason being that if you look at the elections, most of the seats that were allocated to women were seats that the parties felt they could not win. So, so we have to you know, we have to take this with a little bit of uh, pinch of salt. Um, the other thing about the the proportional representation system, I just want to quickly point out, is that the parties get to choose who they want. And they often provide a, a, a priority list. And the lists are often start with or filled with people on top of the list who are connected to the parties, who are connected to the entrenched party owners. So just for one example, if you look at the PPP on top of their list was actually the Dali sisters who are going to So you know, does this really bring in substantive representation in their own? On the issue of the 10% um, Necessary voting uh, for the election to be valid. I think that's an interesting thing. I want to see how that plays out. As, as somebody who studies Pakistan politics, I want to see how that plays out. But I think this is going to bring a change in some areas. So that's interesting. Now, um, uh, you could wrap up. Can, can I wrap up? Okay, um, I'm, which, which means I've gone into the phone. So, <laughs> I just wrap up very quickly. One, we've heard about um, Zia mentioned, so I won't go into details about that. What I do want to show up um, is that during the Zia era, the women's body became a focus of legislation over national situations. And what you had was a number of female of women's uh, movements that also had a bit skeptical use feminism because not all of them used that term. Uh, women's rights women actually came to the forefront to oppose them. I'll take that later. What I'll end with is um, because this is our exhibition, I just want to point out that even popular cinema um, was political. In Ziyad era, you had the rise of such films, the Jami films, which were incredibly violent, as you can see from the images, were rural based, but were very critical of Ziyad. So they still. But these were also films which were incredibly hyper masculine. So while they criticized Ziyad, Ziyad Prat's regime, on one hand, they adopted his hyper masculinity. In opposition, you had movies that came out in the 70s as all at large. And I did talk about this in the question and answer, I don't want to take up another half an hour. But more recently, I, I wish I had time. But more
more recently, you have Pakistani films which are incredibly political as well. So we need to expand what we mean by politics. It's not just about participation. Bol, Dukhtar, and Varna. These are films that are criticizing the implementation of Sharia, aspects of it, but also political uh, parties and political individuals as well. And I'll just end with this. Then we speak, we've spoken a lot about social media. I just want to take you back to 1979 when Iqbal Manu, the famous singer, actually said, How many they can get? Ziyas, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Fez and Face poetry. That was a political statement by excellence critiquing Ziyas' vision. So, you know, this will be going on sometimes. I'll end on that note. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
concerns. <coughs> this will be the gist of my uh, submission. Uh, now, Pakistan, again, coming back to the positivity, I, I call it as a catch up country. Pakistan is catching up again. And it's like you missed 10, 15 years of growth, you missed 10, 15 years of uh, economic development, uh, you missed 10, 15 years of gender balance. Now, having said that, I'd go back to the example of financial inclusion. Pakistan was one of the first countries to come up with a women specific bank. The first women's bank was set up in 1989. was catered specifically, specifically to bring women, uh, business to women and women financial Now this, that was a great step. Over the years that became a marginalized uh, sort of exercise and it wasn't really mainstream. The last five years ago, uh, over the last few years, uh, one of the largest banks in the country, the Deep Bank, HPL, has looked at and wanted to do what is known as women's bank. So HPL Misa, which is HPL Women, has come out with a platform which is totally focused on women. And within that, focused on women entrepreneurs. Now these things have happened over the last five, six years. In many countries in the world, these things have not happened. So, to your point, about when you talk about how, how it balances, I think Pakistan has taken a lot of steps as a result of various uh, changes over the years, as a result of trying to catch up. So, what are corporates doing uh, and what are, what are we doing in Pakistan? Now, uh, an IMF estimate says that closing the gender gap in Pakistan would add 30% of the GDP. So for us, as corporates, this is economic reality. We need, to, we need to bring women into, whether it's the workplace or into the consumer space, be able to benefit from that. So it's really selfish. Economics is selfish. So selfish, we have to improve that. So, so how are corporates looking at that? Many corporates are setting up uh, gender-friendly policies. They're looking at uh, large institutions in the country, which are the education institutions. Um, the two largest business schools in Pakistan have a very focused gender uh, MBA program. Within that, they are giving focus to entrepreneurs and uh, uh, intelligence, which will bring women folks, uh, uh, into the workforce. Uh, companies like Target are going to these uh, uh, business schools and looking specifically for women entrepreneurs. Um, social impact investing is beginning to take off. Uh, you talk about crowdfunding, um, one of the largest crowdfunding. Uh, Awards in Pakistan is led by women. Tech startups uh, in Karachi and Lahore are led by women. Uh, and, and, and they are they're looking at uh, activities that are going to bring more women in. So, so things are going to happen. One of the things that is also very critical in business is to be able to attract women into the workforce. Um, women in workforce are attracted by many things, but also in, in places like Pakistan by role models. So we haven't had a lot of role models. So when you look at politics, the fact that you in the current cabinet have uh, three uh, prominent ministers who are women uh, who are ministers, these are all things that are helping women to, to step up and take, take, uh, take their place. So companies like Unilever have had women running the organization by companies the second way of running it. But one of the largest banks, UBL, has a woman who's running the bank. Uh, I want to talk about one organization which is which very interesting. Women in Leadership, it's a Pakistan based um, NGO which is looking for, for women lead managers and then training them up in leadership. Uh, they partnered with the IBA, which is one of the largest business schools in Pakistan, to look at women leadership courses. And they've just taken four, four days out of the first batch, gone um, out and then are looking for, for jobs. And actually, two of them got picked up by McKinsey. And they're moving to the right. And that led McKinsey to look at Pakistan as a much bigger market for talent. So now in Karachi, McKinsey has 80 people working, which has never happened before. The consulting firms were not setting up jobs in Pakistan, they were doing it out of the way. So with those four ladies, those two were both and of McKinsey, they've got 40 analysts who are now women. Out of the 80, 40 are women. That's quite a startling number for, for Pakistan. And Certainly, they were going on. So that year, the work that elevated it, and uh, uh, the lady who runs it has been 
work tirelessly to do that. Some of these things don't get publicized uh, a lot, but, but they are beginning to take uh, shape. And um, there's another organization called Cir Circle, Circles for, for Women, and it talks about, again, leadership levels uh, and, and training. That focuses particularly on tech, so tech entrepreneurship. In this case, um, they've come up with some, some, some ideas around food banks and food waste. The real needs. These are women coming out with real needs uh, and giving the platform through organizations and hence raising the awareness. And then people like us or other uh, institutions coming up to set up and making the problem. So, Circle came up with a, a competition called She Loves Tech, in which women entrepreneurs are uh, sitting in business plans that are looked at, and those business plans are evaluated by corporates. Uh, some of them are get worked out by corporates in terms of ideas that they may have, some just get funded, and overall they raise awareness. And that awareness has again created a need for more people to, to rise. So there is a there's a lot of change afoot in Pakistan. And when you see how traditional models are being programmed, when women are now sitting at toll booths across highways, that is beginning to happen. Which is something that happens in Malaysia and Indonesia, but it wasn't happening in Pakistan. At the airports, the immigration authorities, a lot of these things were not areas where women would go and work. So these things are happening, and when those things start happening, you start seeing a whole stream of uh, other women rising. And uh, again, to, to Emma's first, first uh, slide up there about uh, young woman, uh, bronze medalist, also getting a hijab, uh, it is breaking those role models. Corporates like ours and others are doing their part. When we work with organizations in Pakistan, we are also asking for their discussion, their, their uh, policies on gender, and how do we look at uh, gender empowerment in the workforce. So there's a lot of positivity, there's change. Pakistan will always be a tough country to operate in. Pakistan will always be, I, I, I now having worked in Pakistan now and looking at these things, Pakistan will never be perfect. It's actually too complicated and perfect. But it's positive and hopefulness that is now there that is making people really want to do more. So with that, I just want to leave you all with the same message. It's the, the youth of Pakistan. One, one, one I think I want to mention is Imran Khan used to say about me, Prime Minister, he used to say at the last election which he lost, that my my voter is a child. They were 13 year olds who were looking at his election last night. They're 18 now, and they voted. They voted for change.